if I'm in a certain situation, if I'm standing in line or if something gets a little tense for me, I might use my little Ada voice to get out of it. <laughs> Excuse me, could you move over, sir? Something like that <laughs> tends to work for me. I'm Joe White, the voice of Chris Redfield. When I'm not surviving the horror of the Spencer Mansion, I'm listening to the Crimson Head Elder podcast. This is Katie O'Hagan, the voice of Mia Winters, and when I'm not babysitting temperamental bioweapons, I'm listening to the Crimson Head Elder podcast. My name is Richard Wall. Just think of me as a ghost from the past. This is Paula Rhodes, Evelyn in Resident Evil 7 Biohazard. This is Michelle Ruff, the voice of Jill Valentine. I'm Reva DePala, the voice of Rebecca Chambers. Hi, my name is Allison Court. My name is Sarah Coates, the voice of Marguerite Baker, and you are listening to Crimson Head Elder Podcast. Want to come to dinner? Back up! I need backup! A rookie cop facing unspeakable evil. There's something really wrong here. These things aren't dying. I just blasted this thing, and it's still alive. One of the most anticipated games of 1998, Resident Evil 2. If the suspense doesn't kill you, something else will. Everyone's gonna die. Welcome to the Crimson Head Elder podcast, celebrating the remake of Resident Evil 2. Very much so with our very special guest, the actor for Leon S. Kennedy, Paul Haddad. Paul, thank you so much for joining us at such a special time for Resident Evil 2 fans and, of course, your fans all across the world that really have just such beloved affection for your portrayal of Raccoon City's most iconic police officer. Paul, welcome. Thank you. This is my very, very first interview uh, online. So this is the very first one I've done, and it's such an exciting experience and a real privilege to meet you and, and to, to address the fans who are, are just absolutely so lovely. So it's, it's, it's a great privilege. Thank you. A privilege for me, a privilege for us as a website to present this to your fans and the fact that, as you say, it's the very first time that you've spoken on the character. Um, uh, my virginity. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be very gentle with you, Paul. Thank you. First question here, actually, going really right back to the beginning, if if we can ask, it's coming from Resi Evil Chick ninety six, and she asks, when did you know acting was something that you really wanted to do? That's a lovely question. Um, I'll tell you what. Growing up, I was always um, a huge movie fan. When I was thirteen and fourteen, by myself, I was the older child, the oldest child. I had a younger baby brother and sister. So I was left to my own devices back in the late 70s and a long time ago. And I was allowed because it was safe back then, or at least we thought it was. And I was able to go and I would sit in movie theaters and watch adult movies like Woody Allen movies oh. or or science fiction movies like Soylent Green and yeah. all these incredible films. And I would literally sit three shows in a row by myself at 13 or, or 11 or 12, no, 11, 11 or something. And I would watch them and I became a fan of, of film. This must have been a, a great era, a, a time to get such an education like that as well. With oh, I didn't know. I didn't know what I was witnessing, you know, the impact of these movies, you know, like New York, New York, which never got the praise it deserved. The Martin Scorsese film with De Niro and Liza Minnelli, a musical, which the song New York, New York, which Sinatra made famous. That movie I saw seven times in the theater by myself. Oh. I kept going back and back. Wow. Three hours long. Brilliant <laughs> film. A brilliant film. Yeah. Make a great musical, Broadway musical. They should do it. I, I just loved it. And I I never, ever turned it inward or made it about me. And then when I finished high school, I just decided on a whim that I would – auditioned for the I saw there was an ad for the American Academy of Dramatic Arts which is very famous in New York um, Robert Redford went there and a lot of famous actors went there I, I learned a piece ironically a British piece because I'm born in England um, I did a scene from Alfie that Michael Caine made so famous oh, yeah. and anyway I put on my Cockney accent for what it was <laughs> and somehow I got accepted and I went for the summer and this was like when I was, I guess I was 18 years old, 17 years old in California, and I stayed with friends of my mom, and I went every day for six weeks, and we did scenes and monologues and worked together, and we did dance classes, which I can't, still can't dance for <laughs> crap, but, but singing I was pretty good at, and it was like 
like a light bulb went on inside uh, of me and I was, I was oh my god you knew immediately this was like your calling well i never knew i was good at anything i knew i was smart at school i, I was a good student I, I i got good grades but in terms of a talent or a, or a calling i wanted to be a lawyer like which you you have had done anyway cut to the chase Right after that, I went to McGill University, and I was about to do my bachelor's degree and thinking I was going to eventually do law. And almost the very – I think it was the very first day I got in a drama class. Um, I took one drama class, and the rest were like history and English and things like that. And in the drama class, I saw a post for an, an audition for a play, and I saw, oh, look, that's Myrna Selkirk. She was the um, teacher, the drama teacher, but she was also directing this play – which would have been uh, an extracurricular thing, which McGill University is known for in Montreal because there isn't a lot of English theater. All the audiences, you get thousands of people in Montreal come to McGill, the university, as though it was the West End in London. Like you get yeah. those kind of houses. Anyway, I auditioned for it. I got the lead. I did it. I got blown away by the, the praise. And to make to cut to the chase again, for two years, I – didn't finish my degree, I, but for two years I did 10 plays, and one of them I directed, and it gave me the bug. Yeah. And out of that, I got accepted at the National Theatre School of Canada, and they only took 11 or 12 people a year out of 1,000 people. So it was a real crapshoot, but I got it, and I went there for three years, and it changed my life. Yeah. And and then I, I, I there I was. I was an actor, and I started doing – while I was at school, I started doing television work. That was it. I fell right into it. So – that's a long answer to your question. But that's no, no, no it's, it's, it's wonderful because I think with a lot of actors, they know that's what they want to do. And it's one of those callings, isn't it? It's one of those arts where I think you know immediately people talk about getting the bug. And I think that's a wonderful education that you got. You know, as a 13-year-old, I can only imagine some of the films that you would have seen during that era. The best films, seriously, in my, in my opinion, other than the 40s, were the 1970s and 80s, yeah. particularly the late 70s. Yes. Um, the bet from you know from the Deer Hunter, from the film Julia, from Turning Point, um, Godfather movies. Um, yeah. I could go on, yeah. but I'm a huge film film uh, aficionado. Yeah. That's what brings us on actually nicely to our next question. It's it's coming from Wesker's report and Gabriel's angel. They want to know to what degree had you known about the Resident Evil series at the time that you took this uh, voice acting job on? Um, had you had you played any original games prior or even known about the series? Honestly, I apologize to the fans. I knew absolutely nothing. I didn't even know the title. When I auditioned, I don't even know if they told me the title. When you audition for something, and this is in Toronto, Canada, a uh, fortuitous opportunity to, to, and a privilege that they came to Toronto to do the first game, I just was reading for an audition for, for a job. I had no idea. It's um, stand in stature, the company Capcom, how incredibly uh, prolific and, and, and successful and powerful they are. I, I just had no idea. So it really was good because I wasn't scared or I wasn't, I, you know, I usually get for an audition. I was like, oh, well, another audition. Okay. And that's the best way to go into it. And I went in. I just read it, you know, a few minutes before I went in. Hmm. And then we had about two or three auditions, like callbacks, they call them, when the, when you get through different hoops, uh, you know. And I wasn't aware there were several hundred other actors, or at least, that were reading. So the best way as an actor is not to think of competing or other people. You just think about what you're doing and what you can bring to something. Yeah. And that's the best way you can do a good job. And lo and behold, I got it. And there, there I was in it. And even at the time, not too much. The, the, the lovely producers from Capcom were, were Japanese. And I think only one of them spoke a bit of English. Okay. So we didn't have any, you know, too much communication there were Japanese representatives from Capcom at the audition process. Um, I believe so, yes. They, in, the, in the background, in the dark, you see the studio, you're in a booth, and they're in this dark little living room that's that's where they record. Yeah. And it was Susan Hart, who I will have to mention, she doesn't get her, her due. She certainly does in terms of the artists that we speak to from the series, because one thing that's consistent is such warm affection and, and, and so much uh, respect and adulation for Susan Hart. It's a name that came up when I did my very first Resident Evil interview uh, 16 podcasts ago, and right throughout, remembered with affection by many of your artists, fellow artists. She actually casts it as well. 
So she's the reason I got the part. It's her okay. casting. Okay. As well as she directed, they they say voice director, which is different than the director of the cartoon, mm. which was one of the Japanese gentlemen from Capcom. But Susan was responsible for all our performances. She is the reason Leon came to be. I give her 100% credit. Myself, well, I'll give myself 10%, her 90% credit, honestly. Yeah, very kind of you to say. Well, it's true. What have we got here? Man, what a mess. What could have done this? What was that? What are these things? All right, that's far enough. Don't move! Don't move. No! What's up with that guy? That was a green hit. Shoot. Get down! <gasps> we can't stay out here. Head to the police station. It'll be a lot safer. Now, question here from JC Wesker, who's from England, actually from Bristol, my part of the world. But he's got some lovely sentiment he wanted to express to you, Paul, and I, and I kept it in. He says, Paul, even though Resident Evil 2 fans uh, will not be lucky enough to hear you reprise your role as Leon in the upcoming remake, there is uh, an enormous amount of affection and, and desire to see, you know, to have seen you reprise that role. So, whilst the remake was received very favourably, the only negative fan response I got were people's comments about the fact that Paul and Alison weren't reprising their roles. Mm. You are very, you are still very well and strongly remembered amongst the fans. Going back to JC Wesker, I firmly believe uh, that Leon S. Kennedy, as both a character and a protagonist, wouldn't be the fan favourite that he is today and across his 20 year legacy if not for the strong foundation of personality that you brought to the role back in 1998 and a role which had my 15 year old self devastated like no other video game had done before with the iconic Ada scene in which she literally slips through your fingers, a heartbreaking moment that would define so much of what Leon represents. Now were you, there is a question in here Paul uh, were, you, were you given any any concept artwork of Leon with which to draw inspiration from? You know, any sketches from the developers? And if not, how did you personally envisage Leon in your own mind with only dialogue and a script to work with? Well, that's, that's, a, that's first an absolutely lovely um, statement from JC. Hello, JC. Thank you so much. I'm so honored that you were touched by that performance um, and it made a difference to you. And it's lovely, lovely, kind words. We were given uh, some sketches, and so I, I, I had an idea what he looked like. I knew he was a young, handsome cop, and I knew he was um, wore his heart on his sleeve. Like I could tell, okay, he was, you know, he really was in it because he wanted to win it, and he he wanted to um, save well humanity, uh, but but on a, on a daily basis, save lives, and 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 there was a real heart to him. Yeah, that definitely and comes so, across. Absolutely, and at the time. 80, was it, sorry, 97? Yeah, 90, well, you would have been auditioned, I imagine, and, and recording in 97. Yeah, the game was released in 98. Yeah, so um, the two icons, and even today in my life, heroes as far as, I would say, movie voice heroes, are Michael J. Fox, Canadian. Yeah. And, of course, Harrison Ford. Both of them, in my mind, when I auditioned, and I, I, I actually have a, a bear, I will say this with a bit of arrogance, a bit of similar uh, quality to Michael J. Fox and uh, raspiness. And I, I always thought of him mm. and I actually got a lot of bookings jobs thinking going in as Michael J. Fox, almost stealing his act. You know, he, he was of course back to the future and family mm. ties. And he did tons of voice stuff yeah. and it was like, okay, Michael J. Fox, he's like the ultimate movie hero the, but the underdog, that's the thing. It was the underdog. Mm. 
Mm. You know, he wasn't like the obvious. I think there were other actors maybe that had that pretty boy looks of Brad Pitt or Johnny Depp. But I think, I, I don't know if I'm, I'm get, getting sort of connecting to what you were saying, Paul, but more with, with Michael J. Fox, he was more the sort of that boy next door and any guy could relate to him. Exactly. Like, that's the thing. He was. I mean, they, they certainly made Leon very pretty, iconically good looking. Um, so that's, you know, appealing. Funnily enough, I, I had similar hair and it wasn't that different. They already animated him, I believe. I don't think that there was a – it would be nice to know, think that they kind of, you know, based it a bit on us. I, maybe they did. I don't know. Both the character models for Leon and Claire do have a passing resemblance of both yourself and Alison. Alison knows, you know, she's almost like the Bible as far as the Resident Evil game and, 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 and well, a lot of stuff she knows. So I would be very interested in hearing what she has to say about it, to be honest. Yeah, we'll talk about more about her after, but yeah. Yeah. Ian Connell from Minnesota, uh, he, he, he kind of draws upon that look of Leon and he, he wanted to know, what did you think of Leon's physical character design, specifically uh, the Japanese pretty boy archetype crossed with an American yeah. hero cop trope? And what about his hair? Uh, and this is coming from Ian, not me. He's saying, I styled my hair after Leon when I was 14 uh. <laughs> and RE2 was released. And that's interesting because you, you were commenting on that. Yes. Well, that's a very good question. And um, Minnesota is one of the best towns in the United States or in the world, really, for theater. Okay. It's the, the Guthrie. The Guthrie Theater is there, the Tyrone Guthrie Theater. And it's it's absolutely res highly res regarded. Mm. So a uh, shout out to you guys, Minnesota. Um, j the Japanese artists, anime is truly, and I'm talking about the movies they make, not just the games, but the feature films. Yeah are absolutely breathtaking. And anybody out there who doesn't know about anime, Japanese, even if you don't speak, you know, Japanese, the subtitles, you get used to it right away, are absolutely mind-blowing. And those are the kind of films and, and uh, art, anime art, that has influenced the Lord of the Rings, and a particular Lord of the Rings and Harry Potter, and all of these films that came after, and computer animation and video games are all thanks to the Japanese art of anime. Yeah. And so Leon is an iconic um, creation, a masterful creation. And the fact that he's handsome, looks shouldn't matter. And, and, you know, honestly, they don't really. But Leon was outside beautiful. So right away you go, okay, you know, he's a good looking guy and he's a cop. So, you know, he's a bit of a hero. I could relate, you know, a little bit to that, you know, wanting to be that. That's what I wanted to be, a hero. I wanted to be good looking, you know. <laughs> And now, as a special gift to the Resident Evil community, Paul Haddad reprises his role as Leon S. Kennedy, the role he so wonderfully portrayed for one of Capcom's biggest ever selling titles, the genre-defining Resident Evil 2. Exclusively for Crimson Head Elder, Paul Haddad now reads in character as Leon from the Resident Evil 2 iconic file Operation Report 2. Guys, zombies overran the operation room and we lost four more people, including David. We're down to four people now, including myself. We failed to secure the weapons cache, and any hope of escape continues to diminish. We can't last much longer than this. We all agreed to take our chances and we'll try to escape through the sewers. Now there's an underground path leading from the precinct to the sewage disposal plant. We should be able to access the sewers through there. Now the big problem is, is there's no guarantee that the sewage disposal plant will be any safer. We know we're taking a big risk, but anything is better than simply waiting here to die. I just hope this report will be helpful to whomever may find it. I wish there was more I could offer and do, but if you're reading this, you already know how grim the situation is.
Alan Wempe Mao and Sonny Bauer, both from New Jersey. I wonder if they've uh, ever met and gone to a Resident <laughs> Evil convention together. But they ask, what are your thoughts on the upcoming Resident Evil 2 remake? I've been sent a few links from all different sources from fans like Valley Joe. People have posted things. And, and a lot of them are saying very sweetfully, you and Allison should have been in it. And, and that's lovely, but we're not. So let's see what happens. Let's see what, let's try to embrace it, okay? Let's do that because Resident Evil is the game itself is the backbone of what we all love. And so let's try and support anybody who's keeping it alive because if we don't, they won't do it. You know what I mean? So let's try and give them the benefit of the doubt. That's all I can say. Paul, do you remember any specifics about how Capcom wanted you to portray Leon? This, this is a question from a couple of our staff members at the website, uh, BSA Arclay from Wales and the Oracle Dragon from Pennsylvania. So, you know, you really do have a, a global fan base. They've asked, did Capcom perhaps use any words like young or naive, brave or caring when they were directing you? They wanted him to be innocent. Um, and I don't know if that was Susan's input. Or, the, or they wanted a, a heart, a sweetness, not an arrogance or a cockiness. Yeah. Fans of Leon and particular fans of your portrayal of Leon. Yeah. When they talk about perhaps how they maybe weren't too impressed or, or weren't keen with how the character was developed in future, actually talk, use words like cockiness and arrogance to talk about further, further and that's no, no fault of the voice actors that came after you. That's the way, oh. that's the way that the character was developed. But it's interesting you sure. say that um, because yeah, yeah, that was perhaps a direction he was taken in that, that wasn't, that wasn't popular with all, all his fans. But also it's it, he, to be, to be not to say to be fair, but, logistically it was his first experience wasn't it yes when we begin something addressing these the zombies and and the horror of what he's facing it's his first time he's a rookie the word rookie was used a lot yeah and i think that's totally applies he's a rookie is the best word to use to describe leon and and that experience i had the privilege of of expressing that experience and it was new to the world it was new to video games i mean it was george george a romero the great film director passed away recently yes created the night of the living dead and all these zombie films he really deserves the credit for creating that genre so i think that was it They're just naive is a good word not stupid but naive yes learning learning on the job and i don't i think the other actors that went on to do it mm. when they went to the u.s to do it paul mercier and um oh, what's the other gentleman's name uh, matthew yeah. Mercer. matthew mercer matthew mercer yes lovely and both are friends on facebook oh, shout lovely. out to you guys <laughs> yes they are and they're very good actors. I didn't do nothing about the sequels. I did. I wasn't told. You're not. You like I said. You're not. The actors are the last to know about stuff like that. I didn't have any ill will or anything. I was like, oh, okay. They did. It, they did it again. And I wonder what they did. And I love their work. To their credit, I mean, they they're taking on the character in later stages in his career and his life. So if they are becoming a bit more arrogant or jaded, that's what sadly happens to, to a lot of us as life takes on, right? Yeah, yeah. We we evolve and change. So I don't think it's a flaw at all. And to, to go back to something that's come up a few times about remake. Mm. Well, remake is a remake. And we can only look at films to know the definitive idea of what a remake is. And they never use the original actors in the remakes. They always reconceive it. It's not the best example, but right now with the Lara Croft remake, hmm. there are, you know, pluses and minuses. I mean, you, it's hard to, to – um, Alicia Vikander is incredible and beautiful and wonderful actress, won an Oscar. Wax Machina, is that a great movie? Oh, I'll have to watch that it's, as a fan of Westworld. It's the same ballpark, and it's absolutely devastatingly great. And she's brilliant in it. The remakes, they're reconceived ideas, and they're done years later. And to be honest, I'm a lot older now. And, yes. and 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 then um, Allison hasn't aged at all, but I have, and and so you know it's what lives on, and everybody's entitled to reconceive and reinvent. That's what art is: is evolved. It's not you know always keeping with the ingredient, the original ingredients, however good they are. I mean, those are wise words, Paul. But I think from a uh, certainly from a fan's point of view, and I've always felt very strongly, and have been disappointed when Capcom have cut and chopped and changed the voice actors is that you know with with this medium of video game and 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 very much that the the emotion you know you're really having to put that through in the voice because we're not seeing that in in in, in your face 
we kind of see you guys as the true representation of that character. So when Leon may turn up in, in, in future, you know, in future games, we like to see the consistency. We like, you know, and, and that's a very good point about him becoming cocky and that's a development of the character with experience and he's no, yeah, longer, yeah. He's no longer a rookie cop. But I certainly as a fan, and I know this is by far the majority of you, and we can see in the community, it would be good to see, to hear you portraying that development of character and to hear, because I think, I don't know, I'd be interested in what you think. My question is always revolve around, do you think it is detrimental to the integrity of the character if the voice actors do change? Because I know in Japan, they're very keen on keeping that consistency of having a voice actor voice the same character throughout the age. Yeah. So, um, do, do, do you like me, or am I maybe being a bit too naive or, or, or too maybe emotional in this in thinking that it does affect the integrity of the character? Well, honestly, um, if I cried a river every time, either I lost a part, didn't get a part, or was replaced, I did, I'll tell you a quick little story, which is I never told. I did a, a role, you know, Free Willy, they did about the whale, the movie. Yes. Um, well, they made a cartoon, for goodness oh, sake. So did you meet Gary Crawford, who also, for your of colleague course. from Resident Evil 2? I know Gary. I know Gary very well. And can I just quickly pop in for, for some yeah. fans? I'm sure many know, but some may not know. Yeah. Gary Crawford is the voice of two hugely iconic characters from the game, both the insidious chief of police, Brian Irons, but he also plays uh, another very popular character, Robert Kendo, both from Resident Evil 2, and I know he was in Free Willy. So, oh, wow, so you, you, you obviously know Gary Crawford very well. Gary is a beautiful kind man and, and darn him he gets more roles than i could ever hope for and that he's a few years older than me but but we've been up for stuff together a world-class actor freeze who are you what are you doing here hold your fire i'm a human oh, sorry about that i thought you were one of them what's going on in this town hold on I don't have a clue. By the time I noticed something was wrong, the entire city was infested with zombies. So I was playing Free Willy, and, and we come back to Michael J. Fox once again. I went in there, and I thought, Michael J. Fox is Willy, okay? That's it. And I got it, and I sort of sounded like him. I copied Michael, and I did it. Anyway, we did 13 episodes, and that was it. And I went off to, to do Stratford, the Stratford festival in Stratford, Ontario, which I'll give a shout out to. Greatest theater festival in the world, I think. I think. Many people think. And I was doing that for two years, and, and suddenly I heard through the grapevine that they did Free Willy. They'd been cast. Five other actors had been cast as Willy after I'd already done it for 13 episodes. And I was like, what? Five other actors? So they had gone to five ABC, the network, which is a wonderful network, because they just got rid of Roseanne herself for being absolutely obnoxious and i admire roseanne and love roseanne but oh, my goodness yeah yeah that oh that my god yeah and they made and, and, the absolute it, right decision yeah absolutely they showed their integrity right there yes, and their balls yes. but roseanne herself is absolutely a genius and, and, and mm. she changed she's up there with lucille ball carol burnett mary tyler moore she is one of the great comedians i'm sorry that she's gone down a, a path right now mm. that is Surprising for her because she represented all the things that were good about being the underdog. Exactly, being Exactly, coming from, yeah, absolutely, yeah. A trailer park, literally. Oh, you know, she really embraced that in that show, didn't she? And, absolutely. And, and, no, yeah. I love Roseanne, and I'll, I think maybe she'll get a pass one day. You know, we all suffer from a bit of mm. emotional difficulties, but, but right now I think it was great that ABC did this. But anyway, yes. ABC did Free Willy, and so I was not fired, but I wasn't rehired. They went through five actors. And suddenly came back and said, Paul, we want you to do Willie again. The reason they wanted to change is because Jesse, the young Zach Bennett, his voice started sounding like my voice. But they thought they got to have a difference. So they couldn't find the other actor to do it. So they came back and asked me. And I said, yeah, I'll do it. I want double the salary. Plus I went, I'm at Stratford. I have to drive in. I want gas fare. And my agent said, Paul, they'll, they'll never do that. And I said, I've already lost it. What have I got to lose? Yeah. They did it. They did oh, it. Well done. So we got it. And we did it again. So we did it one more season. It didn't go on long. And it's, you know, it's not it's not the movie, but it's a fun cartoon. No room for emotion. In you, you, can't, you can't become possessive of a role yeah. or, or anything like that. I mean, like I said, Harrison Ford and Indiana Jones is a rare example. I don't think you can name too many, you know, unless it's television, but too many movies or 
things where an actor gets to take a role on for 30 years or more. There are a handful of them. A lot of them play detectives and stuff, and they're so great. You know, like Tokyo Poirot, um, what's his name? Um, David Suchet, brilliant actor. Um, or, or Ben Kingsley or, or Rowan Atkinson. Oh, well, who gets, ben you know. Kingsley is just incredible. Um, oh. You can see him portray Itzhak Stern in Schindler's List. Oh, my so God. He plays that, you know, almost almost two mild man. I mean, I think Schindler calls him up at one point. When they're going to take him away on the train, he's like, come on, you've got to, you know, you step up, you've know, got to call out. These past papers, Schindler got him so he wouldn't be taken off on the train. But he was too almost meek to speak up. So he plays that character. And like you say, the, the character in Sexy Beast wears... Oh. I'd be interested in your view on this as an actor. There's no yeah. additional makeup. He's just wearing a plain white shirt and the same yeah. and the same face as it exact Stern. And yes. wow, how does he He is a great actor. Not as a good actor. He is as good as it gets. That pool of actors are just world class inspiration. But but anyway, Harrison Ford is one of the only actors in the world that has the privilege of having that kind of career where he's able to take a role and let it evolve. Because how successful he is and the film is, but most of us out there don't. And a lot of it comes down, I'm sorry to say this, guys, but a lot of it comes down to money. And if money talks, and if something makes money, then they're going to go with it. But, like, um, I mean, I, I know Resident Evil 2 made a lot of money. But it was up into Resident Evil 5, it was Capcom's biggest selling title in that series. Wow, you know, great. But um, the actors themselves are, like I say, we are the servants, really. You know what I mean? Yes, yeah, yeah. The handmaids or whatever to the producers and things. That's why we're gypsies, and that's part of our blood, in our blood. We're used to it. Well, I'm sure bringing that humility to your roles is definitely, I'm sure, has played a part in you getting getting these roles, Paul. What's going on? I arrived in town, and the whole place went Great. insane. The radio's out. You're a cop, right? Yeah, first day on the job. Great, huh? Name's Leon Kennedy. Nice to meet you. Mine's Claire. Claire Redfield. I came to find my brother, Chris. Hey, could you open the glove box? Sure. There's a gun inside. Better take it with you. Still in one piece. from Wales and the Oracle Dragon from Pennsylvania again. They've asked, do you have any memories of your time recording dialogue for this game? But more specifically, do you recall meeting any of the producers, such as Shinji Mikami, or the directors like Kamiya-san? My grandfather, David Lewis, God rest his soul, my mother's father, is a Welshman. And so I'm one quarter Welsh and I'm so proud of that. <laughs> well, he'll be the pleased. Great to hear. Burton, the great Richard Burton is from Wales. Oh, I mean, they've got some incredible actors. I mean, I'm I'm enjoying Anthony Hopkins' performances in West. Oh, Wales. oh my God, Anthony Hopkins! Anthony Hopkins is is exquisite. You mentioned before the Japanese developers, you know, kind of lurking in the shadows during your audition. We eventually got to meet and talk a bit. Oh, They're lovely. Did. Laughed. I remember they laughed. Were they oh. making them happy? Was so good. I remember them as being, it was almost like a, a movie within a movie or a game within a movie. And they were through a booth almost all the time. And most people don't know this. I don't know if the fans know this. But when you record ever for a cartoon or a video game or even a movie and you do dialogue, you record alone. 
we hear this often. I think there's only one occasion during the production of Resident Evil 7, just recently, yeah. that we heard that the characters actually got that opportunity to act together and to play That's off each other's awful. emotions. Yeah. But I think testament, though, Paul, to your delivery, that we can hear that emotion in your delivery, that you're not working, because a lot of, you know, particularly with Leon, you're having a lot of dialogue with Ada, Wong, and a lot of dialogue with, with yeah. Claire. So testament that you're not being able to see your, your fellow artist and, and, and play off their emotions. Does that not present a greater challenge being on your own like that? I Absolutely, but you, you have to give the credits, once again, to Susan Hart. Yes. Susan Hart united all our characters together. Susan had to be the interpreter as well as the uniter or, or the one to marry our characters, our performances, yes. our emotions together. I get the performance that she knew would hook up with Ada or with, with Claire. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, it really was left to her. You just go in there and do 20, 30 takes or, you know, and then they'll pick and choose. Yeah. Leon, please, escape. No, we're a team. I can't just leave you behind. I'm just a woman who fell in love with you. Nothing more. Ada. No. Ada! The self-destruct sequence has been activated. All employees proceed to the emergency car at the bottom platform. I will always remember you. Goodbye, Ada. That, I think, relationship with Susan and your performance, it, it, it's just all come together. And the influences that you've brought, you talk about Michael J. Fox and also your your attitude going in. And uh, your I think it really sounds like, irrespective of whether this was a video game as opposed to maybe a, a film role or a television role that you would have got where you would have been afforded a greater biography, it seems like you took, took this character very, very seriously as well. Oh, yeah. And it, it was fun. You know, it was because I didn't know. I saw a bit of an the animation that, that had been previously made of the game. Okay. Just the background, the background, like, you know, the, mm -hmm. the, the location of, of where Leon was in the Raccoon City. So I yes. saw a bit of the darkness of it and the, um, you know, the, the mood, the fear, the element of in the air of immediacy and, and presence and, and, and being alone. So recording it alone was cool because Leon was alone for a lot of the game with the zombie. Yeah, so it gave it a really good, um, you know, you, you had that immediately. Being in a booth, you felt like you were alone and you are scared. You don't want to F up, you know? <laughs> that was great to hear you talk about sort of from your point of view as the artist that actually played the role. You, you talk about the, the eeriness of the Raccoon City streets and being isolated and alone and that you kind of take that into the booth. And that, that was wonderful to hear you say that. But you know what I just learned? The first Resident Evil movie, I don't know, maybe all of them were made in Toronto. That city okay. is Toronto, guys. Ah, there you have it. <laughs> well, the fans are always trying to kind of pinpoint the geography of, of particular states in, in the U.S. And, and which one oh, yeah. coincides the most with Raccoon City. Toronto has played American cities in the most famous movies ever made. Last year's Oscar winner, The Shape of Water, yes. set in Baltimore, was filmed in Hamilton and Toronto. Toronto can be any city in the world. The movie Chicago which won the Oscar, was filmed in Toronto. The movie Moonstruck, which was Manhattan, New York, was shared, Nicolas Cage, Norman Jewison made it, in Toronto. All of your greatest films ever are Toronto, and you not you don't know if that's a great Toronto. is like the um, heart, and, yes. and, and, and it, it can evolve into any city you want to make. So make your movies in Toronto, guys. Do your video games in Toronto, please. I beg you. And it produces some of the, the, the finest voice artists there are. So many times we, we speak to voice artists from that part of the world, and we've got to get you together with Alison at some point, singing the praises, yeah. of, Toronto, singing the praises of Toronto, because I know she, she's a huge fan of Toronto. And, and Very dedicated. I mean, she's oh, had a she lot is. of... She's uh, a top, top director of voice now herself, as well as an actress. It'll get better than her. What happened? You're bleeding. I... I, I ran into this woman who is in trouble. Her name's Ada. 
right after that, someone tried to kill me. Nearly succeeded, too. Ada went after the sniper, but I'm worried about her. You gotta find her before, before something happens. But you've been shot. I'll be okay. It's Ada I'm worried about. A great time to bring us on to one of our final questions. It comes in from Bloody Eye from Missouri. What is it? I'm sure this is not the name that his mother gave him at birth, but he, <laughs> he goes by the name of Bloody Eye. Okay. He's a big fanny, and he's really kind. He often supports our interviews with questions, and he's asked, how does it feel to have your performance in Resident Evil 2 be remembered so fondly by millions of fans worldwide 20 years after you recorded your lines? Wow. Well, thank you for that lovely statement. Um, it's It's... With absolute humility, it's heartwarming beyond words. And it, it gives me the opportunity to mention a couple of people, if I can. Absolutely. On Facebook, one of my closest friends is a lovely lady named Valerie Jo. And that lovely lady is a mom of two girls. And she's a prison guard. She works in a freaking prison every day of her life, up against literally physical harm. God knows what she has to deal with. And she's a huge fan of Leon and Resident Evil. And we become dear friends. And Valerie Joe, I give you a big shout out, a big hug from Paul. I've worked very briefly as a duty solicitor at police stations, so I only got a, a tiny insight into perhaps that tension and stress and that danger. You know, you can put yourself under when when you're dealing with all sorts of situations, people that are brought right. off the streets by the police in, into situations where you're in very close quarters. So, sorry, isn't it interesting that Leon is a, a cop? I get a stamp of approval. That's a huge compliment. You had a question that you wanted to say about the idea of playing a cop. Thank you for bringing that up. Yoke from North America, and he always hits us uh, with some fantastic questions, sometimes quite esoteric, quite eccentric questions. And he wanted to know, if you had to be a cop for a day, would you do it? Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> I, I, Law and Order, SVU... Mariska Hargate and, and Chris Maloney, particularly Mariska, yeah. are like in my blood. I love them. Okay. And she, for example, a began of an actress who's played a role for 20 years. It's mm. going to be the 20th anniversary of Law and Order SVU this year. And she is still be as beautiful, if not more beautiful, than she ever was. And is so intense and so good. Yeah. And she, she is the female Leon, if there ever was one. I can remember coming across Law and Order many, um, at least 15 years ago, and I watched. I used to love watching it. And what struck me, because at the time, I, I, being a solicitor, was there was no kind of pomp and circumstance about it. It was very kind of real, and I love the fact that it took you from each different procedural aspect, or you know, from from the crime on the street to yeah, you know, getting yeah. arrested. But then you would then it would take you through to the court procedure. And yes. which a lot of shows didn't do, and it kind of took you right through, and, and that, I, that's what I loved about the show. Sticking with Law & Order, JC Wesker, he asks, what would be your weapon of choice if you found yourself, Paul, on the zombie-infested streets of Raccoon City? I, I hate guns, and I hate what it does. My God, the humanity, if you haven't learned anything in history, is absolute horror of what weaponry, and, and particularly automatic weapons, it's just disgusting and shameful but the question is in good faith so you know the ones that can just blaze fire flame throw you know something like that not just a gun it sounds like you've done a bit of research on this because i think that's a good answer <laughs> yeah yeah i researched i went to school and studied <laughs> um a question by yoke and alan wempe mao they want to know what are you up to now and if you had anything in the works invader studios in rome and they did a version a remake of re2 and it's because of them and their work and their dedication in bringing that project yeah. forward that Capcom actually took it on for themselves and that we have this remake. Right, right. But they yeah. really are at the forefront in championing survival horror. Mikel Giannone is a young man. It's crazy. He is so brilliant and so kind and, and supportive to me. And he is the one is probably going to bring Paul, like Sunset Boulevard, out of, of the woodwork of the cobwebs <laughs> and bring me back into the video game world. So I can't say anything more. But guys, look out for Invader Studios and maybe Paul Haddad uniting somehow soon, okay? And I'm so excited to possibly be a part of something. 
any further developments that we can talk about, Paul, of course, they'll see that come up on Invader Studios' Twitter feed. Soon, I think. Very soon, guys. Keep an eye on their Twitter feed. Keep an eye on our Twitter yeah. feed, Crimson underscore head, and, of course, the website. But we'll, we'll see developments. Um, but I just want to say a shout-out to him and people like him and you that – Keep this legacy alive. It's so rewarding, and we owe you guys a lot of gratitude. And so do the fans, obviously. They love it. They eat it up. Oh, thank you, Paul. Thank you. And I have yet to see, but I know Invader Studios are absolutely at the forefront of the legacy that Capcom has created. Let me guess. You must be Ben, right? Get up. Now. What do you want? I'm trying to sleep here. Is this the guy? Ben, you told the city officials that you knew something about what's been going on, didn't you? I don't know anything. And even if I did, why would I want to tell you? Okay, I say we leave him in there. Does anyone know where they put the key to this cell? I have it right here, officer. But I'm not about to leave this cell. Those zombies aren't the only things crawling around out there. What was that? Like I said, I'm not leaving this cell. Get out of here before you lead it right to me. Hey, I'm not going anywhere. I'm the only cop left alive in this building. What? Look, if you want to live, then you're going to have to leave with me. But do you even know how to get out of the city? There's a kennel in the back of the building. Inside the kennel is a manhole. Go through and it'll lead you to the sewer entrance, but it won't be easy. All right, I'm going. Well, it's been wonderful, and you have been nothing but a gentleman. Mr. Paul Freshwater here. George Trevor's my nerdy Resident Evil name. Okay, 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 <laughs> but did I blow yeah. your cover? No. Uh-oh. <laughs> it's fine. Yeah, edit yeah. that out. Yeah. This gentleman, I think, should be the next David Frost announcer. <laughs> I'm serious. You're doing the country and the world a disservice if you don't move forward into broadcasting, because you're gifted. You've got a lovely voice. You really ought to do it, my friend. Well, this is my posh voice my mother wants me to speak with that I put on for you guys. When, when, when I'm not talking to voice actors, I'm, like, I'm, all, I'm all Cockney, mate. I'm all like Well, that. right, mate. Yeah. <laughs> all Cockney. I, I can't do that anymore. I talk like, um, try and talk like Michael Caine a little, you know. I don't know. I can't do it anymore. That's very good, no. mate. You got it down to a two. mate. Oi, Leon, come on. We're heading down the cop shop. They've got some zombies down there. We, we want to put a few it's bullets in mate. there, old noggin. Oh, my Lord. What's up, man? Oh, cool, blimey, yeah. All right. There we go. There's your I'll remake thank dialogue, my mom. guys. I'll thank my mum. I'm sorry, guys, for the bad. I'm usually better at accents. I got the Russian accent. Like I used to play a lot of Russians on television. But all joking aside, we really will look forward to hopefully hearing some developments with you working with Invader Studios. Oh, I hope so, too. And I want all you fans, I don't know what word I should use. They're not fans. You're friends. Miko Martini, yes. Valerie Joe, number one, Jeff Asbury, Allison Court, Susan Hart. Capcom, of course, but Invader Studios, Invader Studios, Invader Studios, and that's all I'll say about them until they make their announcement. Well, Paul, if I can just quickly say on behalf of all, all your fans, uh, which you so humbly, so lovingly call as friends, if I can just say thank you so much. At this very special time with the remake, bringing that humility to your experience with seeing the remake up there and being able to take us back to the original, because that's really why the remake is so... Well, that's why there's so much excitement yeah. about this remake, is yeah. the fact that it's coming from one of the most... I mean, it's a genre-defining game, Resident Evil 2. It's coming from one of the most popular video games of all time. And it's been a privilege for me to speak with you and to present this to the fans. Paul, thank you so very, very much. It's been a privilege having the best do this interview with me. I know how wonderful the game is. And um, so, like, I can't even say proud. It's almost like a shock. Yes. Particularly this year with, with, with the time, you know, being the anniversary and the adulation for the game and for Claire, my, and other people's, all the other roles, and Gary Cropper's role. And yeah. It's so lovely because as an actor... You know, there's a handful that become stars, and then there's the rest of us that are out there pounding the pavement, and you don't really get that feedback because there isn't the, the channel to do, you know, to get that. And and it's just so heartwarming. I, I'm not just saying that, you know, I guess when they're famous people, they become almost jaded sometimes because they get mm. so much adulation. Yeah. It's almost like they can't tolerate anymore. It's like they, they soak, it, soak it in. But for me, it's not something I get a lot. 
I've had praise and I'm grateful for it. The greatest praise, of course, is being hired for a job. Mm. You know, the greatest praise is being hired again, yes. like the first time, but being, being rehired by, by either the same people or by other people because of your, your, your work. But this is just so, like, such a nice little gift. And, oh, this is lovely you know, for you to say that. This is not how I imagined my first day. Due to the citywide outbreak, you are advised to take shelter at the Raccoon City Police Station. Free food and medical supplies will be provided to Something's not right. Stay back, sir. I got this. What the? Welcome to the Crimson Head Elder podcast. We've got a very special Resident Evil 2 remake review. Originally released on PS1 in 1998, but now benefiting from Capcom's new RE engine that was showcased for Resident Evil 7, Resident Evil 2 will be released on January the 25th, 2019, and the demo was finally debuted at E3 a couple of weekends ago. Capcom released a cinematic trailer, gameplay footage, and a short demo taking Leon from the RPD's iconic front hall to his tense meeting with Marvin Branagh. We saw beautifully detailed environments and character models powered by the RE engine with an over-the-shoulder perspective, and we were even gifted, treated to a few throwbacks from both Outbreak games and the beta build for Resident Evil 1.5. So, going through the panel here, we've got the band back together again. We've got USS Command from Kentucky. Howdy. Over in New Jersey, we've got Sonny Bauer. Hey, everybody. Just over the border in Wells, we've got BSA Arclay. Hello. And, of course, over in Pennsylvania, the Oracle Dragon. Hello, everyone. So, as a panel, we're going to go through our initial thoughts and take you guys through the remake as we saw it. And uh, it was such a long time ago when we got that reveal by way of a T-shirt. So, I know I, for one, was, was really excited about it. Initial thoughts. BSA Arkley, how did you take the initial reveal all that time ago and, and the reveal on, on E3 evening? Based on um, early thoughts of the game, I, I have to say some of my favourite things so far uh, being the extra details that can be afforded in the original. Um, like the realism, the graphics, and the details and textures and stuff, and like put like posters and letters you see on the wall. Another thing I really enjoyed seeing or hearing is um, when Canada, the developers, he stated that this game is a survival horror with a dramatic subplot, which I can absolutely see in the game. If you just look at the Marvin scene for reference, while well, important information has been omitted from this scene, I think it's very well recreated and sort of plays out like a serious drama production, sort of like early seasons of The Walking Dead, like when it was good. Um, <laughs> and I think the developers have shown a great detail of respect for the title. I don't know if they were inspired by games like Last of Us, but I definitely see like a similar style with the characters where they're more dramatic and realistic. However, on the other side of that coin, I'm seeing things which I don't like, such as the removal of plot arcs, which yeah. I'm sure we'll discuss in a bit. Also, I don't like the handhold in mission briefings, which basically tells you where to go and what to do. I think that takes a lot of like exploration stuff out of the games. There's a lot that I like and equally things that I don't like. It's an improvement on my perspective before E3, because back then I didn't think they'd be able to pull off the pros that they have pulled off. The cons are still there, but hopefully they're not detrimental enough to hurt the game, and hopefully they will be few and far between. So yeah, my initial impressions, are I'm impressed more than I expected, but I'm still cautious. So far what we saw in the demo, they really are going with the horror environment and suspense, which I really, really like. With the storm outside, you head into a building... The RPD, it is a total mess. <laughs> People were in there trying to survive. Zombies are everywhere. 
the tone of, of that Premier reveal very much had an outbreak, Operation Raccoon City feel to it, chaos everywhere. It really felt apocalyptic, more so than the original, that feeling of like an onslaught and a destruction. And you can definitely see that when you actually enter the RPD, there's a real, real feeling of a police station that was completely overrun and is being overrun. They're going to have greater tools in their arsenal for portraying this with a greater console. Better graphics, better textures, now we're going to better look at the chaos. That definitely comes across. They've definitely taken advantage of that, haven't they? It, it looks like a real chaotic mess in there. Yeah, it shows how much the survivors were dedicated to try and keep everything out while surviving inside, but they had no idea what Chief Irons was going to do to them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he kind of yeah, put paid to all their preparation. If nobody knows what we're talking about, listen to our exclusive Gary Crawford interview. <laughs> Oh, yeah, good plug there, Oracle. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. There's that great file, isn't there, where he talks about hiding things and, and gunning down cops. But we'll, we'll get on to Chief Irons because uh, we, we heard from him, didn't we? We didn't see him, but we definitely heard something from him in the trailer. I think we did. I forget what it was, what he was saying, though. He mentioned something about money being deposited in his bank. So I presume that had to be him, you know, in terms of Umbrella, you know, Birkin, giving him kickbacks. Oh, that's right. Yeah. But there are some things I am curious if they're going to add to this game. Besides being a demo and we only see with limited space because demos usually do that, are they going to include Claire's poster picture in the one hallway and is Rebecca's photo going to still be in Wesker's desk? Oh, yeah, little things like that would be amazing. If they add that, I'm going to be really tickled pink. (laughs) I like the look of the game. I think it looks fantastic. Some of the minor details, the information on the walls and stuff and the newspapers, I'm hoping for some really cool stuff in there. I think that'll be fantastic. That's like what I'm most excited about. There's like a lot more missing persons reports on the wall for like RE1 and 2. I think the number was around 10 people, but now there's like 20, 30, maybe even more. The wall is literally plastered in missing kids, missing, missing people. We're going to see a lot more of that, I hope. That's what's great about this new RE engine, that you've got that additional detail and that you can really go up close and and see these things, which is a satisfying alternative to what we used to get, which I really miss, is the the environmental descriptions that you get. You go up to the library and there are books and it says, you know, these are all books on, on biology and chemistry. It really pulls me into the game. I kind of get a really deeper immersion into it. With the loss of those, this great new engine that we've got, whether that's the death of those that we now can actually see see that detail for ourselves. When they didn't have, you know, the the graphical nature that they have today, they had to be clever with sort of, you know, investigating things and being able to see things that may be blurry on the actual screen. So I think they came up with those clever, you know, descriptions that you would get. And I think that with this new RE engine, graphics are so crystal clear. They're giving you, the player, the the ability to be able to get up close and really examine those things. But the drawback to that is the stylized nature of what we used to have. Those descriptions that we mentioned, they were like Capcom telling the story for us, but now we can kind of do it ourselves. But the only thing I will say about those descriptions is I spoke to Welsh and he said that some of them are very inaccurate because they were added after the fact by developers who were making the actual game and not the story. So like Jill's, the photo on Jill's desk, which is, uh, this looks like your boyfriend that just like came out of the blue. So I'm not saying they, they're bad or nothing because I, I still love them, but they weren't exactly accurate. But now we can see for ourselves and we can make our own minds up. Newsbot at Project Umbrella has definitely highlighted with the translations he's done over at Project Umbrella that the localization team that did the English translations for Power Regions completely illogically take stuff out, add things in, in into the files completely unnecessarily that just weren't in the original Japanese. I don't see why we can't have both because Silent Hill has always gave us both until Downpour came along. In Silent Hill Homecoming, for example, you can definitely see the missing persons photos all plastered around, but you can still examine them and get what the character thinks about it. So not just you're getting what you're th- you think about seeing it yourself, your character will have their opinion on it. So you might see a bus stop in Silent Hill Homecoming and be like, oh, look, a bus stop and just run on by it, and that's it. But if you click on the examine button, the main character say, my parents didn't even come and see me when I went to when I was waiting here to go join the army. I thought I was making them proud. I don't see why we can't get both. As soon as I seen the main hall, I just thought Umbrella Corpse. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I just seen that, and I thought, yeah, that looks more Umbrella Corpse than original. I don't have my memories of, like, entering the main hall for the first time or anything, but I do remember, like, the streets outside. That, for me, is a lot more nostalgic 
than the actual main hall. And I hope we see uh, recreations of the, the outside streets and stuff. Um, I don't want to come at the RPD from a different angle. I'd, I'd like to replicate at least the same alleyways and uh, like the bus you have to travel through and all that. I'm looking forward to that. We kind of got two reveals, didn't we? There was that initial cinematic trailer. And I don't know about you guys, but I immediately called it, I have to say, when I saw that rat. And I just immediately was, I mean, obviously we knew that we were going to get a reveal. So that knowledge already, I just thought, wow, you know, since I saw that rat, that's definitely a T-virus infected rat. So that cinematic trailer that gave us kind of glimpses of things to, to look forward to, hat-wearing tyrants, we'll come on to that. And then the actual gameplay demo, walking through the RPD, what were kind of your highlights, Oracle? Everything about it so far. <laughs> I'm really anxious to pre-order it now. <laughs> We've got two pre-order options, haven't we? The the uh, original and then deluxe version that gives us the, the classic, the music from the classic original game. And a lot of extra goodies from what I read up, like um, three versions of the Samurai Edge, exclusive outfits, the soundtrack. And there was something else, I think. Oh, well, we get Elsa Walker as well, don't we? From the uh, from the 1.5 build, we get Elsa Walker's outfit. Yeah, everybody's tickled pink about that because there is a lot of 1.5 stuff in this. The problem I've got with things like that is, are we going to take an Elsa Walker costume over them changing the dates of when Leon and Claire actually arrive in the RPD and, and breaking, you know, the narratives of out from Outbreak and RE3? Because that it's not enough to satisfy me with the Elsa Walker costume. I, I doubt it, whether it's enough for, you know, BSA Arkley on what you were saying before. Hell no. Hell no. <laughs> Like the throwbacks and Easter eggs in Resident Evil 7. Well, that's a uh, good point. Yeah, O'Brien's... Uh, uh, O'Brien's book, Unveiling the Abyss. Yeah. There's also a report from, uh, I think, Alicia, I think, Alyssa Ashcroft as well. I want something more than a cheap throwback. Then, yeah. you know, I want something to actually relate to the plot, not just look and say, oh, yeah, I know that person. USS Commands, what were your initial thoughts? The way they presented it and everything was much better than the way they announced Resident Evil 7, which I thought was a piece of shit when they announced it. <laughs> uh, but, uh, well, when they first announced it, if you go back and look on the Resident Evil 2 thread, my response was I'd rather them reboot the series instead of remaking Resident Evil 2 because I was afraid they were going to screw up the uh, plot because with my knowledge of Raccoon City, with the fate of Raccoon City audio drama stuff and all these other little details I soak up, I know that Resident Evil 2 is kind of like in the middle of a spider web. Mm. So if they start messing stuff, the entire web just breaks to pieces. And when they announced the the thing at uh, E3, as soon as I saw Can of Tomatoes, which was the same brand that was used in uh, Resident Evil 7, I was able to recognize, oh, this must be Resident Evil 2 Remake. <laughs> so I, I got it yeah. on the rat, you got it on the tomatoes. <laughs> yeah. I will say that the game looks good uh, from the trailers and from the uh, gameplay. Uh, it looks like it's a very decent, solid game, but my fear from back then is still here, you know, very heavily. Out of a 20 to 40 minute gameplay demo, depending on who you're watching, we've seen enough plot holes and changes that pretty much throws out tons of lore. You know, Leon's ex-girlfriend may as well not exist anymore. Tony, Fred, Aaron from Outbreak may as well never existed in the RPD because their whole story of trying to escape through the tunnel underneath the fountain is pretty much being used in Resident Evil 2, so they're all gone. Yeah. You know, there's things like that that really annoy me. But, like I said, it still looks like a decent, solid game. At the same time, though, they're also referencing that same story stuff which just makes it, makes it very asinine to me. You know, they did the research to reference it, but they also didn't do the research not to throw it out the window. In terms of the actual gameplay, whether a particular diary date is out of place with the narrative from Resident Evil 2 and 3 and Outbreak, they've already dated Leon and Claire's arrival into Raccoon City with this remake as being different to that traditional story. So that's already a break with the, the canon timeline. Does that have a fundamental effect on the actual gameplay because if this was a new ip it would make no difference or you know if they change the dates back to match with that original narrative would that have a significant effect on the gameplay or not bsa art clay particularly talks about gameplay story and narrative as being very very important and almost sometimes more important than the gameplay so if the narrative isn't there you can't even make it to whether the gameplay is good enough could you guys stomach all this if you saw it and this has been mentioned that it's more of a reimagining, like the you know the Chronicles games, perhaps, rather than seeing it as something that's actually going to break the canon. Could you enjoy it that way? For me, it's kind of fifty-fifty. If they were going to make it a reimagining, then they should have had it 
done it more like the Chronicles because people see Darkseid as Leon's retelling. People see Umbrella Chronicles as uh, Wesker's retelling. So they could have started out Resident Evil 2's reimagining as Claire standing in front of t- a terror save, having a speech about what happened to her and it, or something. And there you go. That's what the whole Resident Evil 2 remake is. So that way anything they change is just her faulty memory or whatever. So if they wanted to do that, they should have done it better. But as it is, like if it is a reimagining, then besides having small little new details added into it that we could consider canon to our personal head canon or to the lore, however we want to handle it, there's not a whole much, you know, there's just not really a big point because overall you're just playing a, you know, you're not playing something that's going to add anything. It's anything big, so. I think with like some of the NPCs that were in files in the original, like Elliot Edward and David Ford, I think what they're trying to do with this remake, sort of like a, a more cinematic game experience, like like they want Leon to interact with some of these people. They've extended Marvin's role a little bit more to actually yeah. actively helping him as opposed to just, you know, sort of he tells him, you know, what happened and then he turns into a zombie later and you got to put him down. I think they're trying to make it a little bit more sort of cinematic because they can, because they could do more with the characters rather than just like, oh, you're reading this in a file. There's another story here. There's exposition. There's there's other things that happened. They're trying to meld it together, I think. Well, so far, it's really going into the horror aspect with the storm and how dark it is. It makes you very tense because you don't know what's coming up ahead. And I really like that because you just get like, Oh, something's going to happen. Something's going to happen. There's going to be a jump scare coming here. Oh, 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 it's just a freaking window being smashed. Okay. Oh, was that? A, should I be worried about that? You know, that kind of thing. Yeah, definitely. I felt that increased foreboding. It was a lot darker. Yeah, because you don't know what's happening. Because in the old game, you could see everything. There was no light changes or anything. Because you see what's ahead of you. With this, you depend on the flashlight and your, your vision. And you go down the hallway, you can't see what's coming up ahead. And like with the old one, oh, there's a zombie on the floor. With this, you can't see it till you're shining your light on it. And okay, there's a problem. I've always liked that. I mean, that was my favorite section from Resident Evil 4. It's got a 3.5 feel to it from like the 3.5 trailers back in the day. Sonny Bar, you've been patiently waiting there in the wings. What were your initial thoughts? I'm actually uh, kind of excited. Of course, I'll get a little nitpicky about like, you know, the RPD and gameplay maybe later on. From the initial trailer and uh, demo gameplay, from what I've seen so far, I love the uh, experience from a player's perspective. I think that they're trying to go back to their roots with with horror and and darkness. It doesn't seem to rely too much on jump scares. There's a lot of atmosphere. I thought it looked gorgeous with the graphics and uh, and the atmosphere with the dynamic lighting and, and, you know, using the flashlight to look around. I think at this stage in the outbreak, it makes sense that a lot of the power would be, uh, you know, cut off. So a lot of the areas would be dark. It does lose that, you know, sort of that well-lit feel because then you could see everything, uh, you know, in a room that you're looking at. But it it looks it looks great. And um, they added bathrooms. So there's that. You could hear the cheers online when they discovered these bathrooms. As long as there's something gameplay mechanic-wise to do in the bathrooms, like in, in the Spencer Mansion, in the remake of that, you can get the old key or, or survival knife from, from the bath. And that was a great moment, putting the plug and the water coming down, you know, the zombie bursting in. So yeah, maybe, maybe with that, we're going to get some fantastic bathroom action. Did anyone else feel with that so the opening gameplay with Leon, where he's got a preset path... And he's got to kind of move his way past obstacles, but it's very preset, the path he's got to take. And for me, I kind of got very much the same feeling as the Ivy University section in Resident Evil 6. That was received really well by the community. I think it was one of the first things we saw from Resident Evil 6. But when we actually got to play it, it felt painfully linear, but still visually was one of the better sections of that game. And I just couldn't help feeling with this game in terms of the lighting and the actual gameplay mechanic. It very very much felt like a throwback to that. I think it's definitely an introduction for, like, a new player because you you could totally feel that it's, like, a small, like, introductory, like, exploration area because there's no zombies around, you know, everything's, like, quiet. Then all of a sudden, after you get that first cutscene with trying to pull Elliot out of the shutter... And he gets ripped apart. All the zombies start crashing through everything. Up oh, here we go. We're kicking it into high gear now. 
just to state, I pretty much have the same concerns as everybody else here. Just like with uh, USS Command, when they first announced it, uh, what was it, two years ago, I groaned. <laughs> I, I just, I, I groaned. I'm sure a lot of other people groaned as well because this is this is Resident Evil 2 we're talking about. It's arguably the best game in the series considered by most fans. And uh, to remake that, it's it's like, you know, you're, why why change anything? You know, or why tamper with that, if you will? If it's not broke, don't fix it. When we got the the trailer and the and the demo when that um, dropped at E3, pretty much just like with everybody else, I I think the game looks gorgeous. The style is pretty much a 180 of what the original is. It, it's it's well lit in the original, whereas in this remake, everything's dark and really you know damaged and destroyed. And you could tell that there was a you know a real sense of chaos in the whole police building. And we have those positives with the look and. Um, you know, the atmosphere and the sense of dread everywhere in the RPD, I still have the same concern as everybody here that I'm worried. Like everybody else said, all of these 1.5 elements coming back, uh, especially in terms of the concept art of the uh, main hall of the RPD. Yeah, that was it, nice to see. It was, it was nice to see, but I'm wondering why... I find it ironic in a remake that they're going with something that was initially scrapped for what they felt... They didn't want to use in the final version. This initially started with Invader Studios remaking the game. And mm -hmm. then, you know, as we all know, it was taken over by Capcom. It's their IP. They, they flew the guys from Italy, Invader, out to, to Japan. The approach that Invader Studios were going to take, and very much, you know, being champions of that old school survival horror, I would imagine it was their their thoughts to incorporate as much of of the 1.5 build as they could, not to break the narrative of RE2, but just in terms of the look and design. Capcom Japan did make a, a point of saying that they were going to be taking advice and, and feedback from the community and from Invader Studios. So I imagine a lot of that would have come perhaps from those conversations. But I think you know, that concept art, it certainly makes the RPD look like a more workable, realistic looking. Oh, absolutely. Position. It was really iconic to go into the original and, and see the statue first, but it makes more sense that the desk is brought to the front because you go into the RPD in the original, it's like, well, who's there to greet you? <laughs> you know what I mean? It, or do, do you get ushered off to the west side or the east side? Yeah. They've got the new staircases. They've got the two in the main hall. Like you said, it kind of reminds you of the Spencer Mansion. Although it pulls at what's iconic about the original, it seems to make more sense than the emergency ladder going into the second floor. Yes. Um, I really love the original RPD. It's so unique and so iconic. Same thing with the uh, with the side hallway uh, where the dark room is. They've gotten. They've now got a staircase going to the third floor from there as well. It makes sense because there's no other access point to the third floor to the to the clock tower besides going up into the library, taking the staircase up there, <laughs> and taking the door out to the to the balcony that's in the main hall there. That's the only access point to the clock tower on the third floor. So I'm conflicted because it's so unique the rpd from the original and it's so iconic but the these changes that i am seeing for the remake seem to be more plausible for i guess practicality if you will to to be able to roam around this place it kind of makes sense with the remake honestly even though it's tearing away at my like purist <laughs> you know uh thoughts about it Hirabayashi says that aside from elsa walker dlc costume they haven't implemented any 1.5 stuff which hmm. is obviously false because you got the Clay and Ada outfits, you got the Mr. Extra door, right? You got the RPD layout, you got the shutters doors. Who, who Do are you trying to fool? <laughs> well, I guess it would depend on which 1.5 they're talking about. Because if he's talking about the 1.5 that everybody obsesses about, uh, you know, the one with Leon starts on the helipad and Elsa starts with the crash and her motorcycle through the front door, maybe he's meaning that one. The way the uh, main hall has been remodeled based on that concept art, they made that for the version of Resident Evil 2 we got. Because if you hack into demos files, there's still a pre-rendered background, untextured, for having a desk right in front of the uh, statue. As someone who was really positive about the initial announcement, my main concerns, as much as the canon issues, 
were the perspective and the atmosphere and to me I was just blown away I thought it looked wonderful it was really dark I know some people prefer the, the brightness that we got with the original and that kind of matches with the eeriness you get from George A. Romero's zombies that are roaming in, in the big American shopping malls and that's all in the daytime with that bright light it can be quite eerie yeah, I thought it looked fantastic. And my my main concern was the balance, you know, between keeping true to the original, preserving the gameplay mechanics and the atmosphere that made that, you know, made, made me connect with the game that much, made it such a, an iconic classic, but also connecting this game, you know, to a modern audience and making it viable on these current consoles. I think that they have got that balance right, but there were some unnecessary changes to the canon dates, We've talked about outbreak scenarios involving various RPD officers that have come back. Great to see them come back in files and cutscenes for the remake, but why have they changed those? Yeah, and Resident Evil Two, like uh, USS Command said, it's 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 in the middle of a you know a spider web, and you mess with yeah. that, a lot of other things can come crashing down. See, I think it's the developer's way to emphasize the fact that this is a reimagining rather than an actual direct replacement for the original because the changes that they have made, they don't affect the narrative significantly. They're just little things that on the face of it seem unnecessary, but I think they're actually purposeful just to distinguish this away from the original. So you've got little things like Marvin not knowing anything about the mansion incident, you know, whereas in the original he mentions about Chris and the others in the mansion that's like kills the story because that's one of my points. I hate that. It hasn't made that specific plot arc non-canon, but it's just taken away the link. Marvin also mentions that star stuff and outbreak. In one of his reports, the other officers he straight up say is, of course, if we listen to stars. You can say whether this is the case with you, but other people that have got criticisms for this game, I think are being a little bit unfair in the sense that not appreciating that the remake we got between the original RE1 and Remake, Remake had a much easier task because it was carrying over almost the same signature gameplay mechanics that, that you had in the original. Yeah, but not just that, that was like the beginning of the story, so it's... But this is like in the, the middle of a stack of cards, like so it's always going to be difficult for them. They've had three years. <laughs> Go to Batman on newsboards. <laughs> Remake carried over all the same gameplay mechanics of fixed camera angles, third person perspective, pre rendered background, mm -hmm. and was able to get a, was able to get away with that. Whereas this re remake for RE2 isn't going to be able to do that, isn't going to br bring those gameplay mechanics over with it because they're far too dated and we're using this mm. new RE engine. If you take that into consideration, then you can kind of afford to be a lot more sympathetic with this remake. Compared to the, the Spencer Mansion, the RPD doesn't lend itself well to having any like kind of small minor additions that aren't you know going to have any significant effect. The Spencer Mansion is a lot more self-contained. So when you had these kind of small extra additions, they didn't feel as jarring as I think they're going to feel in this remake, unless they're, you know, they're really intelligently fought through. The Birdcage Corridor in Remake is just that little addition that's added on the side. It doesn't disrupt any, any gameplay, doesn't disrupt the story, but just kind of helps the strategy of the game, helps the gameplay because it gives you that alternative route, whether you're low on health or whether you need to get a particular combat item, you can decide to go that way, or sometimes maybe you are, you're forced to go that way, and, and you know there's a zombie on the other side of the door. I think they've really, got their, they've really got a challenge on their hands. I think it's going to be a lot harder to find those places in the RPD map where they are going to be able to kind of bolt on a little extra section that's not going to have any, any jarring effect or detrimental effect to the cannon. What I see, what I see with the birdcage room uh, in the first remake, I just consider that the, the stairs in the, um, the hallway uh, by the dark room. Just going all the way up to the third floor, you've got that extra third floor hallway now. It might still lead you to the clock tower, just a different route. The first remake, like GT said, you know, they use the same camera angles, they use the same gameplay mechanics. All they did was expand the Spencer Mansion with some story that was still plausible to work with the rest of the pathways of the mansion. Everything worked just by adding a couple of things, but it was pretty verbatim. With this remake, from that interview, I think it was Hirabayashi that was talking about the Claire A, Leon B, Leon A, Claire B. They decided to just make it a Leon campaign and a Claire campaign. So right there off the bat, there's going to be, I think, 
changes to the story that are going to accommodate whatever it is that they're going to do with the characters because essentially what you're going to be doing is you're going to be playing from one perspective and then the other perspective. It's not going to be Chris and Jill from the first game where it's essentially almost the same perspective with a different supporting character. I don't know. I'm trying to play devil's advocate here, but that could be something worth thinking about. That should be very simple for them to do in, in that regards. Is this, you know, take Resident Evil 2 story, take the four different scenarios for the A's, you know, for the A's and B's, combine it into one thing, and there you go. But they're still going out and making these changes that really, you know, throw things out the window. That's going to conflict with Resident Evil 3, which now also conflicts with Confidential Report 2, and it might conflict with the fate of Raccoon City timeline, too. The simple thing is changing a date. It's like a domino effect. It's just going to start knocking over a bunch of things because a lot of that stuff is pretty tightly interwoven. I don't mind where the little changes don't have a significant effect on the gameplay because I, I can comfortably take this as a reimagining, but there are those changes that can have quite a dramatic effect across the whole timeline. An example is if you take all the RPD files that you can find across Resident Evil 2, 3, both Chronicles games, certainly Umbrella Chronicles, and the Outbreaks game, you get this really intense narrative of two teams of RPD officers on either side of the building. You've got David Ford and Elliot Edwards. They're trapped in the West Wing. On the other side, you've got Rita and Marvin separated in the East Wing. They're the ones that have got access to the main hall. Marvin instructs Rita, you know, to make to make her escape, and there's that plan in, involving the statue at the front. Uh, that then leaves the other the, the other group that, that are trapped in the West Wing, and you, you know, you get this really imaginative narrative, which has now been completely destroyed by re, you know by remake retconning this scenario now, where you've got Rita suggesting this plan to Elliot, and. All of those files are now completely invalidated uh, across at least five, possibly six titles that have preceded this remake. The consistency of that timeline is completely destroyed. They combined the main survivors of both groups into one. And if you take the file for Elliot Edward in the remake into consideration, I think he says it's, uh, it's just down to me and three others. Marvin, David Ford, and Rita, because who else would it be? So they've com I think they've combined the main survivors from both groups into one in this remake. They combined the West Wing survivors and the East Wing survivors together in this remake. Well, that leaves out three cops that were in the outbreak. That leaves out Tony, who's the canine uh, special trainer, uh, Aaron, who was at the emergency stairway defending, and then Fred, who was on the roof defending. <laughs> I'm hoping there's a few more surprises, though, because they made it out to be, like, this time around, we're going to interact more with the survivors, and then we find out that there's only three survivors. I watched the E3 playthrough of the producer of playing it, which I kind of regret because he solved three puzzles in a row, and I'm like, dude, you know. Oh, man, spoiler alert. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. but uh, he, he kept going on about how there's going to be a bunch of cameos from characters from different games. Jesus. Open up! Give our initial thoughts now what we thought of the character models for Leon and Claire and, and Marvin and of course for the, the BOWs, the zombies that we saw. Leon seems like a more realistic character now. Yeah. Um, I am a bit concerned about how he was warned to stay away from Raccoon. If they could contact the outside world then why didn't they ask for help and you know contact the news and the government and get this thing spread across the media but they just phone a rookie and say don't come into work. So. <laughs> That's a good point. <laughs> The uh, radioactive waste thing that leaked out Raccoon City that was announced on that was announced on the 24th or early 25th, basically a day or two after the outbreak starts, because the outbreak starts on the 23rd, but in, only in small pockets. And the uh, RPD mostly just grab zombies and lock them up in areas for quarantine because they're trying to keep the whole zombie outbreak quiet because they knew most of the people's jobs in Raccoon City were revolved around Umbrella. And they kind of realized, like, oh, shit, stars are right. We, you know, but we can't let this get out because our livelihoods are at yeah, stake. Yeah. 
with when it comes to news reports, what BSA Arkley said was right. Uh, majority of it was kept quiet by the uh, military. They wouldn't let anybody in or out of the city. Uh, so the people who were reporting the news inside the city, those broadcasts were only stuck inside the city because we hear things like uh, there's a news report and uh, that hunk picks up in, the, in the, his uh, mini game in uh, Umbrella Chronicles where it says it's been days now since we had contact with Raccoon City. But at that same time in, in the outbreak games, we actually see news reports and radio stations reporting about people trying to get out, people trying yeah. to you know need rescue and all that stuff. So it was pretty much the military keeping it shush and quiet. But at the same time, Umbrella hacked into security cameras and started leaking that stuff up out online, showing the UBCS fighting and dying, trying to save civilians, and pretty much trying to save face. And you say, we're trying to help the U.S. government's not, and that's pretty much how that whole thing goes. See, this is part of your spiderweb that you're saying. This is the whole narrative that we've got that's uh, played out across Resident Evil 2, Resident Evil 3, you know, both Outbreaks games. Yeah. It's very easy not to break that spider's web if they simply accord with the dates and not kind of throw in any jarring additional facts that are going to break that web. If we can just bring it back to the character models. Well, Claire and Leon actually looked their age because a lot of people have pointed that out. A lot of my friends say, I can't believe they actually looked their age now. She actually looks like a college student. He actually looks like he's a green blood. Yeah, because <laughs> yeah, Leon has no idea what he's going to get into. It's his first day of the job. He got his uniform on. He's ready for work. He's put into a zombie apocalypse, and Claire just comes to town looking for Chris, and she's like, Ah, oh, I just got out of college. I did not expect this. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what's great about this point of the narrative rather f- further along, where they are, you know, skilled stars members, you know, members of Terra Save. You're actually right, Oracle. It's good that it, c- it comes across in their, their models that, this, you know, this is very much their first steps in, in, in that journey. Yeah, because they don't know what's going on. They just arrive, and next thing you know, they're having to survive and kill stuff in order to get through and figure out what the heck's going on. There'll always be that little part of me that was like, oh, they they changed what the originals, you know, looked like to something yeah. to something different. I mean, I some people were saying that the original versions of the outfits, like Leon's RPD outfit, like it seemed like too cartoony or too like I don't know, like even sci-fi or something like that with, with the mean, way with that the. the extra armor. Uh, well, in the original, yeah, like I guess the way that the armor was like plastered onto the actual tactical uniform or something like that, combined with like you know the the grays and the whites in his outfit, like it seemed like a like space copy type of outfit or something. I I don't particularly agree with that. I think he is still probably the truest uh, representation of blending original to this new look. It's great to see that he seems to look his age. I thought they did a wonderful job with the new model. Uh, he's still got his same haircut. He he seems to be the one that's least uh, tinkered with. Claire, on the other hand, and I've heard some uh, some opinions about this. I think even maybe the we heard something about the developer saying that her old outfit was too scantily clad. You're right. That did come up in an interview. I'm wondering if they think that the actual original version of that seems too scantily clad, or if they're talking about the fact that they made the Dark Side Chronicles slash Operation Raccoon City one even more scantily clad than the original version was to begin with. Yeah. They turned it into a two piece and had like you know her her stomach showing. They gave her like the cowboy boots, the collar was flipped up and stuff like that, more like a cowgirl type of thing. Whereas in the original, it just seemed to be sort of like a one piece spandex with like cut off jean shorts and a vest now it looks like it's just a jacket and and pants she kind of looks like zoe from left for dead so there's she does, quite yeah. yeah there's kind of too much of a striking similarity for me it's almost as if they were completely inspired to redesign her based on that so I, it, it makes her less iconic in my opinion and and all all i want to see is if she's got the made in heaven queen reference on the back of her jacket because oh, that would i can't believe they won't go with that <laughs> Yeah, that would make it unique. I, I guess somebody confirmed that it's not on the back of her jacket. It's just a plain jacket. Well, after I did that bit out that I just said then. <laughs> the original character outfit was like modeled around like a bike, uh, like a motorbike enthusiast. And I didn't yeah, they have that. changed that. It looks a lot more like the, her Revelations concept art. Still got like a leather jacket and stuff like she, like she is a biker. And I, I, I thought, well, I don't remember her ever being mentioned that she's a biker, but I checked the Resident Evil 2 guide and she is a motorbike fanatic. She owns two oh, okay. bikes. Elsa Walker was modelled as a biker as well, wasn't she? Yeah, so she basically got elements of her personality from Elsa. She owns uh, two bikes, one black one and one white one. So, yes, she is a biker. 
But I know it's been picked up by Alison Cool. There's kind of a, a, certainly a passing resemblance, isn't there? Yep. She she made a tweet about it where it looks like her, but it's it's not her voice. <laughs> My God, the most fearsome zombies I've ever seen in any video game, and they looked and sounded terrifying. For the zombies, I love the details they put into them and the fact you can practically blow up their limbs and body parts and stuff. When it comes to Mr. X and Ada's outfits, you really got a detective theme going on right there. Yeah, it's not exactly subtle, is it? She's meant to be hiding the fact that she's a spy, and she's standing there with that trench coat. And the lighting actually really, really puts into the fact that she, I am a secret spy, and nobody should know what I'm doing. We were going to get onto it eventually. What do we think of Miss, Mr. X, or, or Mr. Hat, as he's perhaps now known? Well, there was concept art of him actually wearing a hat, but it also kind of makes you think, grab a hat, put it on, oh, the detective, maybe he would help us. You know, kind of like that vibe to it. So that's probably not what you want with a tyrant. Well, on Fallout 4, there's a character named Nick Valentine, who's a cy- he's a synth, a cyborg type. Well, he's a robot person, and his skin's all messed up, and he's wearing a trench coat and a hat, and he looks almost identical to the fucking tyrant in uh, Resident Evil 2 Remake. I have it posted on the uh, Crimson Head Elder Resident Evil 2 thread. Are you the one who posted the comparison picture? Yeah. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah, you're definitely right. It looks almost uncanny. That hat better fall off his head after the first five minutes. Well, I'm just curious, since he comes down off a helicopter, why is his hat still on him? That's a very good point. Did he he hold it on when he fell? (laughs) It's a piece of his head. head. (laughs) Kind of like using it as a parachute. Mary Poppins. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Oh, God. (laughs) I actually do have an idea how that tyrant hat thing works when it gets dropped out of the helicopter. In ORC, there's concept art for tyrants getting dropped in. And the way ORC's concept art shows it is, uh, in Resident Evil 2, if you remember, when it get, when a tyrant gets dropped in, the pod yeah. opens up in the air and he falls down. But in ORC's concept art, the pod hits the ground and then opens up and allows a tyrant to walk out. So well, he yeah, might have to change it for that way. I just keep hearing detective music playing in the background. <laughs> <laughs> I certainly prefer the, the canon version where, you know, he kind of, you know, he hits the ground and you really kind of feel that weight, you know, as his boots hit the ground. That's weird to me. You said it happens in the concept art because in the in the final game they fall to the ground uh, without the pod, just like in the original RE2. I think it got cut out for time or due to Capcom portion the rewrite stuff. A lot of that Operation Raccoon City concept art is absolutely fantastic. We've got it at the site in our rarities and media section. I don't like Mr. X's wrinkled face. Oh, it's definitely a Freddy Krueger effect, isn't it? And yeah. I don't know why they did. I don't know why they even did it. They're supposed to look more human, so I understand maybe the hat, you know, kind of disguising him, maybe from afar. I mean, because he is like what seven, eight feet tall to begin with. But the fact that he's got a wrinkled face, I feel like they were just g- going with like, oh, let's make him a little bit more scary looking. And we we have the uh, the technology to you know to put the details in his face, so let's just do it. Uh, his face they, is just terrible. They might have gotten it from Umbrella Chronicles. I was looking at the character model for Ivan's, and their face are all wrinkly and stuff. Even their fingers and hands are really super wrinkly. Oh, that's interesting. I didn't notice that with Ivan's, and that's perhaps because of one of the things that I kind of was focused on that I didn't like, and they brought it back again with this hat, is that I didn't like the battle visors that they wore in similar vein. I don't like the hat. Their skin's not as bad as it is in Resident Evil 2 Remake, but there is a lot of wrinkles there. But I did notice that their hands, they look like old man's hands on a tyrant. So I'm thinking they might have gotten it from there, but still, there, I, I see the complaint. It, they took it to an extreme with see, Mr. Wonder, X. See, I wonder, going with the original, they're being birthed, and you, and you have that scene with the tyrant at the end of Resident Evil 1. They're brand new, aren't they? And they've all, always had that very smooth, unblemished perfection in their, in their skin. And I wonder if, on new generation console, whether that would deter from the horrifying nature to them and, and, and really Capcom just, you know, the designers just felt this was the only way to to look scary. I think yeah. I would arguably find it more unsettling that their skin is so smooth. It's just a generic t- type of, like, uh, scary trope or whatever to give them, like, wrinkled, disfigured skin because we've seen it so many times. And the blemishes are all over. They're, like, circular, if you look closely. Around his entire face, he's got, like, circular. And the circle gets bigger, like a spiral. Well, my thought is, since this is Resident Evil 2, if you look at the tyrants in Damnation, they have smooth skin, so maybe their skin smooths out with later research? Could be, you're right. This is certainly very early on in their tyrant production line. 
could just be a unique model because there's the unused Tyrant C in a, from Outbreak that has a red coat and green blood, and he's got a horn sticking out of his head. Mr. X from the remake, do you think he's one of the Tyrants from the video game Survivor? Well, all the Tyrants from Survivor are mass-produced models, so they're just the baseline. They should look like they look in the Outbreak or RC. Considering how I think Mr. X's name came from the Perry novels, if I had a guess, I think they're just taking Capcom's taking that name and making Mr. X more unique as like a unique model, kind of like the two photos I sent with Ivan or uh, Tyrant C, and that's why he looks different. Uh, I, I think they look. <laughs> You're great. kind of making a zombie noise then. In, in yeah, the- I'll do my Alex. <laughs> ah, they do look fantastic. Um, can't deny that. Um, I, I just thought it was nice to see that they brought back some of the the original ones. Like you got the the homage, the you know the girl who had the cut off jean shorts. Oh yeah. Oh, did you yeah. see her? Yeah, they've re- revamped her. She's in the trailer as well. So it's nice they give these previous zombies an update. Also, as we saw in the gameplay, the amount of damage it takes, you know, even just to slow them down, let alone put them down, really adds to that tense gameplay. You've got those claustrophobic, slim corridors I was pleased to see. It really did, for me, make for some tense gameplay. I'm glad they brought back the dismemberment thing from the original Resident Evil 2. I mean, it's just a small little detail. I always liked how you can like, shoot their legs off in Resident Evil 2, shoot, their, shoot both their arms off, things like that. Glad that's back. And they really were bullet sponges. You could really see in, in that gameplay just how, how much ammo it was taking to even just put them down. They got shot in the head like five times and they were still walking towards you. There was that one shot, wasn't there, where that zombie almost hardly had any head. Yeah. (laughs) I did like that detail. When they were shooting him in the head, you could see the head just practically falling apart. But I am curious if they added the part where if you shove the zombie off, his arm gets ripped off in the process. I want to see that. (laughs) Oh, Oh, yes, right. They did have that in the original. One of the things that really showed off for me that the new engine and, and, and the great detail of the zombies was in that shot of Leon just kind of pulling back the jaw, and it just looked fantastic. I have a bit more to say about that. The dead cop that Leon checks with the whole jaw ripped out like it is, it's very reminiscent of how a cop dies in the uh, Biohazard 2 Hong Kong comics. In Chapter 1, page 14, there's two police officers, and they're getting attacked by a liquor, and as one of them turns around, uh, the liquor's tongue goes right into his mouth and rips out his jaw in the same air, in, the, in the same spot as the dead bodies that Leon oh, finds. Wow. Yeah, because yeah. if you look at the comic page and then look at the body that Leon finds, it's really something interesting to see. One observation thing that goes back to that dead guy that I was thinking about. After Leon gets done examining it, he then turns around. There's like a dead guy hanging from the ceiling with a big piece of metal stuck through his, like the back of his neck and sticking out of his yeah, mouth or something. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and my thoughts was, now how in the world could a liquor do that to somebody? That's what I was thinking. <laughs> And so then I started thinking about this. What if that was Nemesis that did that to those two cops? We know in the original Resident Evil 3, Jill visits the RPD and she goes down that hallway. So what if there were some more survivors trying to help? Brad, heck, it doesn't even have to be Jill because we know Brad was running around too. Brad could have been at the RPD and two cops try to help him. And then one gets Nemesis's tentacle in his face and it just, you know, barely grazes his jaw and does that rip out thing and the other guy gets grabbed and shoved up to the vent where he gets you know left there to hang i think the zombies look fantastic the, the level of detail with the exposed like you know areas of the decay in their skin and yeah and the blood and just the ooze that comes out of them and i thought they all the amazing. dismemberment oh yeah they say art clay you play a lot of horror games i mean have you seen zombies the undead looking as good as this as fearsome as this in any other game there is like a big leap. I imagine it to how The Walking Dead revamped the zombies because for The Walking Dead, all the zombies in the movies, they kind of look samey and they didn't, yeah. they didn't look. And then there was this massive upgrade. And I think yeah. that's what Resident Evil 2 has done now. They've upgraded these zombies to like a much more realistic, scary look. I love that because Capcom in the past have always been, at the, for me, at the forefront. When they brought out Resident Evil 4, it was like a AAA game on a new generation. They've always been ahead, you know, even with their their engines, you know, the framework engine, I think, was it for RE5 and Resident Evil 5, still almost to this day, it's one of the most beautiful looking detailed video games. So when they've kind of fallen off that perch in the past and the series has lost direction, 
I'm really pleased to hear that, that they're back on top, certainly with the, you know, the models of, you know, the zombies, because my God, you know, those have got to look good if this game's going to pass. They've always been ahead of the curve. Yeah. They've like showed everybody else how it's done. And that was my problem with Seven. All the other games laid the work down for everybody else and said, yeah, follow us. But I felt like Seven was them saying, oh, we're going to do what PT did and we're going to do what Condemn did. Put a bit of Play Witch in there. That's not what I'm used to with you. Kind of like Naughty Dog as well. They can, they're they ahead of everyone else and they show this is how it's done. And then everybody's like, yeah, we'll do it that way. <laughs> I take your point about RE7, although in terms of where the, where the series was going after RE6, I, I felt they had to maybe go with that. Not a tried and tested formula because, you know, PT never released, but in terms of the reception that PT got, I think that, the, you know, the developers, the designers of RE7 knew that if they kind of went in that direction, they, they were almost certainly onto a hit. Interesting, they didn't keep the first person perspective. What you see in several of their interviews where they talked about initially they wanted to do a pre rendered background and fixed camera angles and all this stuff, and they did actually seriously discuss it. The fact that they did that, I didn't think they'd even entertain the idea of pre rendered backgrounds and fixed camera angles again. The fact that we've gone back to the horror now obviously shows they are listening to the fans, and there's certain fans out there who think Revelations um, laid those foundations for the horror or Resident Evil 7, obviously. But I think Remake HD, I think, had a lot to do with the reinstallment of horror in this franchise because yeah. that, that game just like smashed records on PSN. And they showed Capcom that there is an audience for this and there are people out there who want the horror in the games. That's one of the takes that I got and that's what I really enjoyed when I saw not the cinematic trailer, but that first gameplay trailer. The Oracle Dragon mentions the rain and the dark foreboding atmosphere. I really got a, a feeling of the Spencer Mansion, a similar palette, browns and, and, and kind of it was very dark. That cut scene that you see with, um, is it Elliot? You know from almost the start, this is a mature rating when he's cut in half by the, uh, by the shutters. They don't hold back with that cut scene, do they? I'm just glad they're actually bringing back the gore. <laughs> because with the past few games, they cut the camera away so you don't see them getting decapitated or anything. With this extra gore, and it felt almost more mature, this extra darkened atmosphere and kind of foreboding presence around every corner with the extra fearsome zombies. Perfect context just to drop Brian Irons in. The comparison between Brian Irons we got in the original RE2 and Darkside Chronicles, f for me, you kind of had a, a far more over-the-top version in, in Darkside Chronicles that I kind of, for me, came across almost a bit comical. Whereas in the original, and I think the feel of the new RE2 is perfect for that, the original incarnation, which was very much kind of a real subtle, nasty, insidious feeling and these lines to, you're not quite sure what, what he's going to be doing with that body in front of him, but, you know, whereas it makes it very bloody clear in Darkside Chronicles. I loved his, his portrayal in the original RE2, and, and I, I think he's going to be perfect for this remake. For people yeah. who want to know, listen to the Gary Crawford episode. <laughs> yeah, because we, we interviewed the voice actor for original Chief Fires, didn't we? I was re-listening to the entire podcast the other day, and I kept thinking, remember how he was saying he was hunting down people in the RPD? Maybe we'll be finding some of those bodies or signs of the struggles and happening, you know? We might actually see the stuff that Chief Irons actually did in there that's written down in his diary. Imagine right. finding that in the game, all those traps he set up. Oh. oh. Maybe like like an extended Irons role where he's where he's going at it with the Stars members leading up to the incident. I don't know, maybe in the game he's thinking about that and he's thinking about interactions with Birkin and you know and all the pressure going to him and his psyche and stuff like that. That that might be an interesting touch to see how he's just totally derailed, like, you know, mentally. Yeah. They got in that iconic shot of the liquor crawling across the window. That was great. Oh, uh, that was incredible. Yeah. I'm, I can't wait to see it, like, in the light. I think we only saw it in the dark, but I want to see what it looks like up close. And if the zombies are that fearsome, can you imagine what the liquors look like? Uh, apparently, they changed the, the mechanics of the liquor, because whereas before it could it could go front and back, now it can go 360, apparently. So it can oh, go on, onto wow. the walls, onto the ceiling. So imagine like they are in the Damnation movie, be more yes. like that. Oh my word. Why is Sherry not in her school uniform? Sherry looks less like a, like a Japanese schoolgirl in this, and I guess more Americanized, if you will. Well, she's still got her pendant, hasn't she? Yeah. yeah. She's got longer hair, don't she? If they actually release a trailer from Claire's side of the version, or a demo of her side, maybe we'll figure it out. Very one-sided on Leon's campaign, right? <laughs> I was disappointed that 
someone that, you know, plays centre stage with Leon, joint billing, she's almost like kind of relegated to a secondary character. And I'm sure that's not going to be the case with more footage that we see. But I think two things that are certain, we don't have the zapping system. She is going to play a different campaign to Leon. More importantly for the canon freaks, it looks as if we're starting with a Leon A, Claire B scenario. I think it's interesting uh, that they show more of Leon. It's a smart move on their part right now, just introducing it, because Leon is the token character, a fan favorite, if you will. I know Claire is also a fan favorite, but I always felt Claire's story was slightly stronger than Leon's story because it, it connected to more elements throughout the series, like her being a Redfield, Sherry being like connected to the Birkins, who are responsible for the outbreak. So I think I think they're kind of not showing us as much of the story by showing us Leon more so first. But there's just more connections to the, the rest of the whole Raccoon City incident, whereas yeah. Le Leon and Ada are kind of like, besides Ada's connection to John with the mansion and stuff, they're both kind of fish out of water. I mean, I love both their stories. I just feel like there's more there with Claire's yeah. scenario, and maybe they're holding back a little bit first. Is anyone here? Jesus. They're everywhere. I'm giving you an order, rookie. You save yourself first. Help me! Please! What in God's name? I like the gunplay because some people don't realize you could really dismember the zombies in the original Resident Evil 2. One thing I remember doing was, like, if you get bitten by a zombie, if you mash the right button come by when you push the zombie off, you rip off its arm. Yeah. And then you can shoot off the other arm, and if you're lucky, you can then shoot the zombie's legs off with a shotgun, so it'll be crawling at you with no arms, which looks hilarious. I saw a similar type dismemberment in the demo where you get to shoot off their legs and arms. I thought, yeah, yeah, that's back. But the problem I'm having with the combat is the knife. The knife is, it basically, it, it runs out. You keep smacking things with it, it breaks. And the problem I have with that is, like you, you see in the demo, Leon needs that knife to open up one of these little panel things to open up a shutter or something. So let's imagine, you know, you're out of ammo, so you're smacking a zombie in the face with a knife, and then bam, it breaks. The zombie's dead, though, and now you go to the area you need, and oh, look, you need a knife to get in there. What do you do? That knife thing is going to get a bit repetitive, though. Oh, God, yeah. I think yeah. that's going to be a Hendrix, especially on harder difficulties. Just It just seems like it's going to be really repetitive. Like, after the first ten times, it's going to be like, oh, God, again. Like, in Remake, the, with the, the battery pack and stuff, it wasn't overkill, was it? It happened every now and again. But in this, it seems like it could happen every couple of minutes. I really did appreciate the accuracy of of where you shoot the zombies as opposed to having to like basically pump five rounds into their head to get a headshot. I don't know what the hell that's all about. That's like the Ganados and, and the Magini from five. It's like you shoot them in the face like five times until their head explodes. Zombies, it's supposed to be like a one shot deal. You shoot them in the brain, they go down, but they're kind of implementing, you know, it being a harder type of precision, yeah. you, you know, deal here. But I do appreciate that if you you know if you were to shoot them in the arms and the legs, the level of detail that you can go through to like actually dismember them, it's it's really interesting. You can see each individual bullet hole until it like tears the limb right off. So that's that's kind of impressive. Uh, not something that I've really seen too much from a zombie type game. It's in Last of Us Two as well. Um, when you shoot them now, you actually I think it's like an, a current gen thing now. So. But I'm curious is after you kill them, are they going to still be on the floor or are they going to magically disappear? <laughs> well, they, they magically got up in the Capcom USA stream that I saw with Catastrophe and Code Veronica Freak. What really came across to me was the precision that was needed, but the fact that these were very much bullet sponges. The, the thing I didn't like about RE4 is, you know, you can blast the Ganandos 10 feet away from you. Seeing them just didn't give you the fearsome concern that I really got with these zombies. They were the most fearsome I've seen in the series to date. I would challenge any video game out there currently 
that deals with zombies, deals with the undead, to produce something on a level with what Capcom have done for this remake, because I, I thought they were unrivaled. I, I thought they looked fantastic. And there was that shot when Leon actually has to grapple with one of the female zombies, and she screeched screaming at him. And I, I, th- I thought it looked and sounded just wonderfully fucking shit scary. <laughs> I, I can agree with that, yeah. Well, I'd like to point out something about what Artie said with the headshot things. Capcom zombies, some people in the zombie community always refer to zombies in their game as because they're never really consistent about the whole headshot thing. Even in, if you go deep into the Resident Evil lore, there's things like Leon will say, shoot him in the head, but then Jill and uh, Chris in the Umbrella Chronicles novel says that even shooting them in the head might not kill them. You have to dismember them. It's similar to how you kill them in dead, how you kill things in Dead Space. There's also in the Umbrella Chronicles game, Jill snaps the zombie's neck right while it's between her legs, and there it is, still trying to grapple onto her and take a good bite out of her. I always thought it was just kind of dangling there, caught in between her legs. Like, it's just, like, dead, but it's hanging there because she's still got her legs closed. I used to think that, but you see its hand, one of its hands grab onto her thigh. Yeah, it's pretty fan servicey in a sense, I guess, the way it looks. Oh, it's and her, just downright awful. And then, you know, her dialogue going, oh, oh, no, doesn't help none, so... They're clearly going with this idea of repeated damage is not, is not putting them down, that you've got to be really precise. And even when you are, there was one shot I saw again with that Capcom USA stream where Code Veronica Free could just completely taken out the zombie's head. And there's almost nothing there. And it was still coming for him. And it didn't look comical at all. It looked horrendous in a good way. And that definitely serves to slow the pace mm-hmm. right down. Also, with what I could see, the corridors being clearly a lot thinner, felt claustrophobic. I think the development team are being precise to prevent you from being able to evade the zombies. I mean, particularly with the -the over-the-shoulder perspective, I always felt that it made it quite a clunky, quite a cumbersome task if you're running on the hop and trying to avoid enemies very quickly. I was definitely getting a feeling that they're slowing the pace down, making it a lot harder to progress to kill these zombies, and... To me, I think that's really going to be one of the most prominent signature feelings in this new remake, which I think is going to make it a real success. Well, Canada, he says that it's not an over-the-shoulder camera. It's a new style, and they're calling it a claustrophobic camera. It's more like you you don't really know what's going on behind you, whereas like a third person, you can see like a little bit behind you. But with this, you've got no idea because it's like right up on your shoulder. Like He also says that's like the theme of the game. He wants it to be claustrophobic, so they made a camera angle that was specific to that. How did you guys feel about whether it felt, as it did to me, a lot more linear than the original, where you've got these step-by-step objectives that are marked on your maps, you've got that hand-holding. Oh, God, that gonna... shit needs an option to turn it off. Um, yeah. Because one of the things I loved about the original is, I mean, maybe it's a, a sign of how crap I was at the game, but when, when I was making my initial journey through the RPD, wandering around aimlessly, you know, blind not really knowing where to look, whether you're going to be finding survivors in this room, and you're not kind of told which way to go. You know, is this door locked? Is this door open? Whereas, yeah, with that hand-holding, it just completely negates any reason to explore on your own. Yeah, because when you play the originals, you pretty much are just free roam, exploring, figure out what you need to do by yourself. Not, oh, you need to go here, pick this up, and come back to here. No, you just go around, find objects, then you figure out, oh, I remember this. This is what I needed to get in this room. Or, oh, this is the puzzle piece that I needed earlier. Is hand-holding? No. Free exploring? Yes. The originals, they make you think, oh, what, why, where did I need this? Uh, or where, where is this supposed to go? Oh, yeah, that's right. This is where I've come through previously. It exercised your brain to like try and actually like figure out what you had to do to progress. Definitely feels like it's got that Castlevania finding an item you can just tantalizingly see what's around the corner where where you need to progress but there's something there's an item that you need to get before you can further that exploration I'm, i'm definitely liking that feel about it I really enjoyed the fact that when you do enter the RPG for the first time uh, with this version, you definitely get to hear, did you guys hear it? You do get that iconic bell sound, although really disappointingly, it kind of fades out and then you don't get any iconic, whether it's that signature track from the original or even a new reimagined version. You just kind of get sort of generic ambient sound, which then just fades out into silence, which I think is going to be detrimental on the atmosphere. 
it probably works better for the for the sort of the dark tone because I think if if we had such vibrant punctuating music for a darker RPD, it might I don't know mess with the tone a little bit. But that's just me. I don't know. Yeah, you got to pay if you want nostalgia. <laughs> that's not free. I, I get a feeling the game's gonna rely on ambient like noises, like like uh, rooms with like maybe dripping water or like you know clicking and stuff like that because it's darker. It's gonna be pretty much like Resident Evil Seven, where besides the save room, it's gonna be unnoticeable until you're like in a boss fight, and then maybe you notice it. If they're going for realism in this game, why are the weapons magically floating on their back? That keeps irritating me every time we see that in the gameplay. Yes, you got the shotgun. Please don't have it magically attached to his back. Is there like a magnet in his vest that's keeping it there? This game's on PlayStation 3 that have been using the strap. This is next yeah, gen. They've been using the, the magic of floating on their back since, what, 4 or 5? And yet, in the what movie, Damnation and Vendetta, they are detailed to make sure the weapons had straps on them. So they could just sling it over their shoulders. They even said that in one of the interviews. Oh, we wanted to be sure to have these details and make sure the strap actually moved like it was a real thing. I'm like, well, since you made remake RE2 here and you're going for realism, why didn't you include the shotgun having a shoulder strap considering it's in a police barracks and you could just sling it over instead of just, oh, there it is. Let's go. And the other thing is they're going for details of Leon getting wet when he was out in the rain. You see his clothes getting wet and his hair getting wet. Yet they have him crawling through blood. So why isn't there any blood on his uniform? Well, it's interesting you say that, Aaron, because one thing that they had in the 1.5 beta, you had Elsa and Leon's uniforms would get damaged as you progress through the game and, and would kind of reflect the battles you'd been in with the zombies as, as, you, as your clothes get ripped and injuries would be apparent on the bodies, even with those very early models back in, in the late 90s. Uh, they're using ORC assets. Some of the buildings and cars are from ORC. USS Command, do you want to hit us with your list? You've made a, a huge list of RC. <laughs> but all joking aside, I've been heavily critical of Operation Raccoon City. I've said it before and I'll say it again. The concept art that comes with Operation Raccoon City is some of the best in the series. Yeah, it's a shame Capcom wouldn't let them tell the story they wanted to tell. Yeah, that's right. Slant 6 had something different in mind, right? What assets did you notice that, that are coming up from Operation Raccoon City? Well, the buildings, they got that same design as ORC does, so, they, so they're so they pretty much straight from that. Uh, one of the streets I saw seems to be, it looked almost identical to the street you start out in in the Spec Ops campaign. And it's just, you know, like I said, it's little details like that, but it's nothing new from Capcom considering the, uh, the Raccoon City levels of Umbrella Corps used ORC assets as well, so... Is anybody getting a feeling that this game is sort of looking like a mix between, like, some Walking Dead elements and some neo-noir action going on here? Like, the spy in the, <laughs> in the shadows. Like, you got Mr. X wearing, like, his big coat with the hat, and then you got Ada sort of standing. Like, I think it was the parking garage, but she's got, like, a jacket on, too. You expect, like, some cigarette smoke to, like, emanate from her mouth in the shadows or something. I'm hoping, like, this is a 30-minute demo, which is pretty big for a game that's six months out and it's got a lot of files in there like at least 10 so i'm hoping that's a sign that this is going to be a pretty big game because they've been pretty generous with it i'll say this i'm not happy about the story direction it's going at the moment it does look like a really solid game and i was pleasantly surprised at how much of a good game actually looks when it comes to gameplay and atmosphere when it comes to the future of the series, Resident Evil 7 has me extremely worried about the future of the series, considering how poorly they handled its story. You got files in the game saying one thing, and then you got DLCs going, oh, no, 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 it's, it's this and all that crazy crap about people being able to punch alligators to death. So combine that type of messed up storyline, timeline stuff that 7 has with all the retconning and stuff with Resident Evil 2 remake or remastering or however they're going to handle it, I mean, regardless of what it is, it's gonna be it's gonna come up to what the next writer of the next game is gonna you know what he wants to do, what it's gonna turn out, how it's gonna be. It's got me a bit worried because we might potentially have a series where you know they're going well. Who cares about the story? It's scary, which is how you know Shinji Mikami handled the writing of The Evil Within. When people ask him about plot holes, he's like, well, it's horror. Who cares? So I don't want this series to turn out to be well. It's got enough plot holes to be Swiss cheese, but hey, you know, at least it's scary looking. Don't want that with this series. What worries me is that it, it, I think it's becoming clear, and it, I think it will become clearer as we're shown more gameplay, that 
Whereas the remake of the original Resident Evil was very much, you know, 70% the original, 30% added on additions that didn't have any significant effect on the canon or the gameplay. I think this is very much, and I think a developer actually came out and admitted as much in the Rely on Horror interview, it's very much 70% new addition and only 30% of the gameplay content is going to match the original. That worries me, but I think it is too early, really, I think, to completely condemn it out of hand. I think that the atmosphere and the visuals and uh, I think the gameplay is is going to be uh, quite a treat. I do have the same concern about the details in the story or the characters and where they're going to take that. It seems to me that there is a level of care. They've referenced so many characters by name details of the files that they've written and that they've been a part of but there have been changes you know the the references to outbreak are nice but you know you've got that new operation report where it kind of changes some of uh, the escape plan with rita bringing up the idea instead of marvin i think really what it is is that resident evil has always been great in world building when you go through the original game and you read the files you're like oh there's there's another story here there, there was something else that was going on before yeah. I got here. And my, yeah. cons- and my concern with this remake is that they might take too many elements from what we've previously had, and they might kind of integrate it all in the same story. Like, you know, with the Rita, you know, outbreak scenario and with Elliot Edwards and stuff like that. I think the character interactions are essential. Like having Leon interact with other uh, characters can be a nice touch to help progress his story as opposed to sort of just being by himself the whole time. It might be a nice touch, but if you if you take it from what we've had previously, like the Outbreak references and, and the characters from Resident Evil 2 that were supposed to be a separate entity, that could sort of mess up what made the world building of that wonderful. I play games for, for story and lore, and if this hasn't got a good story or lore, or it doesn't fit then it's just going to be about the gameplay. I thought I thought Resident Evil 7 was about the gameplay. I know some people disagree, but I, I think the story is pretty weak in our game. Story comes first. If it's just the gameplay mechanic, then it's, it's like Friday the 13th game or you know Madden or FIFA or anything. It's just a game you play for fun, but I don't play these. Well, I do play them for fun, but I also take them quite seriously as well, especially the story. I certainly was never expecting the Rita Phillips reference for her to ever appear again. So anything's likely in terms of throwbacks to, I mean, we, you know, we, we, we could even get a, an Ark Thompson cameo. Yeah, dream on. <laughs> Seeing the Resident Evil 2 remake, my first thought was, well, there goes Outbreak. Can you see that area behind me beneath the red tinted sky? That is what's left of Raccoon City. Our platoon is cut off. No survivors left. You'd rather starve to death in here than be eaten by one of those undead monsters. We're both gonna die. Wait, don't shoot. Down. I lost all my men because of her. All is lost. Cries of 